you love these round rotundas, please, rotundas, on the other side. In the morning, the students went out into the fields and they dug their food and they fed the cows and all that. So did the faculty. In the evening, they would come back in the lecture halls, either in the main or the building or in the individual pavilions. And they worked on this. And Jefferson's charter of the University of Virginia, and this is a hoot, listen to this, and this is the actual wording. Goal is, you know, talking about this, to rake the muck from the colony of Virginia. We need people to rake the muck for the students who will learn. The key thing is learn. And what was he trying to make? Was he trying to make engineers and scientists and all that? Not directly. His primary goal was teaching. Here's the first teaching program in the United States. He realized it. Here's my key point. Listen to this. He realized that if a population is going to do the pursuit of happiness, that it has to be a voting public with an intelligent, reasonable outlook based on rationality, based on reality. And the greatest words in his world, except for the pursuit of happiness, are the greater good. He says, you, you educate people. You allow them to read. They will make decisions for the greater good. And this is what's so amazing about the United States today. People go out of their way to vote against their own self-interest. You watch. Like elections coming up, going to be very interesting. Jefferson's saying, no, 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 no. What you do is you, you think about all this. You know, like, stop thinking. You think about this. What you, what you do is you put all this stuff together. You read, you discuss with each other in community forums, you study, you think about it, and then you vote for the greatest common good. People say, well, and I don't want to get into a tax discussion, people say, well, what would it be if the tax people make it over a million dollars a year, one additional percent on their income, in order to give people who have nothing, a little bit something, maybe health care, I don't know, pick something like that. And people say, we can't possibly do that. Oh, heavens. What's Jefferson doing? My guess is that you can see the shaft at Charlottesville, down into the, or not at Charlotte, down into the grave of Jefferson, and attach a turban, because he's spinning in his grave, at so fast, you know, say 100 gazillion RPM, he could probably power the eastern seaboard with the amount of energy coming from that man. He must be just furious. So here's a guy who's talking about things like, we can't possibly do it, things like the greater good, and, and, and can we pursue happiness without blowing it over, without just jamming it into the people who could get more and more because they could adjust the rules to favor themselves without thinking about the common good. It's hard to say. When you come to a class like this, or any class taught at this college or any other, there are things that are limitless that you can figure out and know. Like things that you never thought about, like the chair struck, how, what the architecture of chairs has been since Roman times, or, or the crystal structure of emeralds, or the Tudor king. What's it about Henry VIII that made him such a jerk? And such a hero at the same time. I mean, all this sort of thing. There's, there's so many things to learn, all this. But you know, there is a certain common thread going through the whole thing. Just, just for example, at the end of his career, the poet laureate of England during the time of Queen Victoria, Alfred Lord Tennyson, was asked by a student, he was an Oxford guy, he said, uh, Lord Tennyson, what have you learned? I mean, you've been, you, you're really smart. You've done all this stuff. You've been all of your life in academics. You've been out in the world. You're one of the most famous poets in the world. Tennyson looks at his kid and says, I'll get back to you. I'll give you a week. And a year later or so, Tennyson publishes a poem in which he puts his mind, Tennyson's mind, into the mind of one of the great people of all of history. That is Odysseus. Now remember, in the Trojan War, Achilles, Odysseus, all these people fought together. And the guy, Odysseus, was at the end of this, able to get home. It wasn't easy. One of his buddies, we talked about Diomed when we talked about the nature of albatrosses and why the Jewish name of albatross is Diomed. Well, Diomed goes home without pissing off Poseidon, but not so Odysseus. This guy is a smart aleck, and he, and he makes Poseidon mad. And you know what happens next, if you've ever looked at it, thought about it, or even heard about the Odyssey, you know there's all this action going on. Finally, Odysseus makes it home, and there's his wife. 
He sent the suitors, he meets his son, uh, the, the, the nurse takes it. Oh, it's a long and wonderful story, very, very bloody. But it ends with the restoration of Odysseus in the dining hall with his wife. And Tennyson says to himself, what do you suppose happens next? Here's one of the most intelligent people in the world, one of the best traveled, a guy who's an excellent fighter, wily, crafty, all this. What happens next in his life? Let's go on. Because the Odyssey ends there, you know, at the, at the beginning of the restoration of him with Penelope. So, Tennyson picks this up and he says, I'll answer the kid's question this way. And I just love this. Tennyson writes, I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margins fade forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to rust, unburnished, not to shine in use, for it is my goal to follow the knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bounds of human thought, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Knowledge. Common good. Suit. You think, well, that's all you know, Western stuff. No, it's not. It's not Western stuff at all. Listen to this. The sage of old was profound and wise. Like a man that afford, he took great care, alert, perceptive, and aware. Desiring nothing for himself and having no desire for change for its own sake, his actions were difficult to understand. Being watchful, he had no fear of danger. Being responsive, he had no need of fear. He was courteous like a visiting guest, yet as yielding as the springtime ice, having no desires, he was uncared by, touch, uh, untouched by craving. Receptive and mysterious, his knowledge was unfathomable, causing others to think him hesitant. Pure in heart like uncut jade, he cleared the muddy water by leaving it alone. Now listen to this, I'm going to read that again, I'll read the last line. Pure in heart like uncut jade, he cleared the muddy water by leaving it alone. By remaining calm and active, the need for renewing is reduced. Thank you. Be slow in your actions. Concentrate on what's important. Here's another one. I found this one years ago in an ad for a book on the American Indians by the National Geographic. And I you know, took it out, saved the ad. Apparently, the Indians that lived in the area south of the Great Lakes, the Indians that were involved in Hiawatha, if you've ever read that nominal poem, they had a tradition in which they would go out into the night at the end of the day, where they would, um, I guess, the, the, the guys would probably go out and make sure there was no polar bear, uh, uh, no bears, and no you know, bad wolves and wolf brains and stuff out there. And then, Everybody would leave the settlement, the TVs, and they'd go out separately into the forest, you know, standing maybe 20, 30 feet apart. If you had a little kid, the kid could be with you. But you you were standing apart. And they would look into the sky, and look into the trees, this is at night, you know, before they go back home. And they'd repeat, silently, not together, these words. I stand in good relation to the earth. I stand in good relation to the gods. I stand in good relation to all that is beautiful. I stand in good relation to you. I am alive, and if I live for another day, I promise I will learn one new thing. Now I look around, and I know I'm old and a dinosaur, and I don't have quite all the neat toys or know how to run them. My son helps me with those quite a lot. I do have an ability that I want you to generate too. And that is, I can sit for a while and think about something. And I don't always have the right answers. I usually get led in different directions, but I can think about something. And it's always fun. And that's what I mean by looking out and looking ahead and making the best decision. This semester has been particularly interesting for me. For one thing, uh, this semester uh, I've had more students than I've ever had in my life, you guys. In the other part of the world, 65,208 students have used my textbooks this semester. 
all over the world. I've had a chance to travel to various places. I have a new employer, the National Geographic Society, I'm working with them on this. I have, luckily, survived the chemo that made me so weak at the beginning of the semester, and sometimes I can hardly walk. My God, I was here every day. I actually retired last May, and this was the last time that I planned to, or maybe we'll get to go through the story that I started 16 weeks ago with you. It's uh, an interesting emotion, because I'm really not quitting. I mean, I'm, I say to my dean and college president and the board, I get to maintain my office here at the college, so I'll be around, you know, I'm around quite a lot. And I'll still continue to write and work and do the television stuff, but it's not going to be quite the same because, as I told you the first day, this class is the center of my professional world. And I'll still be involved. I'm going to give get lots of guest lectures here at the college. And I have obligations and opportunities all over the world. I have two more uh, lectures I'm supposed to give at Hawthorne University in the spring, I hope. But I think, I feel like my favorite character in in Shakespeare, which is Prospero from The Tempest. He has a difficult situation, which I did not have, where he finds himself isolated with his daughter on an island. And by studying and by knowledge and by learning, he obtains all kinds of powers and uses them for good, never for evil. And at the final end of this story, if you've ever read The Tempest, you know, it's quite a remarkable piece of work, Shakespeare's last play. Everything comes out fine. And Prospero, at the end, says, you know, all my powers are overthrown. What strength I have is now my own. And then simply puts down his hand. And I have a remarkable family. I, my son is here today. Um, I have friends from the planet. Mostly, I have students. About 70,000 of you, some of whom have returned today. And so, like Prospero, I put down my pen and I will see you for the final in two days.